The Bible tells us, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. It says to receive with meekness the implanted Word, which is able to save your souls, and to be diligent to present yourself approved to God, rightly dividing the Word of Truth. Join us now for the 3ABN Sabbath School panel, our study today is the book of Revelation. Hello and welcome to 3ABN Sabbath School panel. I'm Jill Morricone and we are so excited that you have joined us for a study of the book of Revelation. We are on lesson number six, the sealed people of God. We just came out of the six seals and it's almost as if John takes an interlude when we get to Revelation chapter seven. At the end of the sixth seal, before we even break open the seventh seal, we do this little interlude and I'm excited about our study today. I want to encourage you to go to the website if you would like your very own copy of the quarterly. That's absg.adventist.org. That stands for Adult Bible Study Guide.adventist.org. Or you can always visit your local Seventh day Adventist church. Let them know that 3ABN sent you, and they would be happy to give you a quarterly, and you could join a discussion group yourself. I want to introduce our panel at this time. To my left is Pastor Ryan Day. Okay. And my sis, Shelly Quinn, and another sis, we're so glad to have you here, Yvonne Lewis Shelton, and then Pastor John Lomacain, our pastor here at the church. It's a privilege to open up the Word of God with each one of you, and thank you for the time you put into studying and preparing and praying yes. over it, and I know the Lord is going to bless this lesson in a special way. Sure. Before we go any further, we want to go to the Lord in prayer, and Yvonne, would you pray for us here today? Father God, we just thank you so very much for the privilege of opening up your word and learning more about the revelation of our blessed Savior, Jesus Christ. So we just ask for your presence, the presence of your Holy Spirit to anoint every word that's said and to be in our midst. You are welcome in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Remember in our discussion last week of the fifth seal, I know, Ryan, you had that. And they said, how long, O oh Lord, how long until this, the persecuted, those who have been martyred for their faith, how long until God stands up and mm -hmm. does something about it? And we see the beginning of that in the sixth seal, that God is ready to deal with those who have harmed his people. The sixth seal brings us all the way up until the moment just before the second coming of Christ. We see that. I want to pick that up, actually, in Revelation 6, verse 17, the last verse of Revelation 6, and then we're going to jump into Revelation 7. Revelation 6, 17, it says, The great day of his wrath has come. And who is able to stand? Remember the wicked in the verse before were saying, fall on us and hide us from the face of him. They want to hide in the caves and the rocks because they say, who can stand? So Revelation 7 is the answer to that question. Mm -hmm. Who can stand? The sealed of God. And that's what we're going to talk about here today. So let's look at, I have uh, Sunday is restraining the winds. I have the first couple verses of Revelation 7. Uh, Revelation 7 begins with the four angels who are holding back, as it were, the four winds of strife until the servants of God can be sealed. They're holding back the four winds. Now, in the Bible, the four winds is mentioned several different times in the Bible. In Daniel 7, the four winds can churn the great sea. In Daniel 11, the four winds can uproot and scatter powerful empires. In Jeremiah 49, the four winds are deployed against a nation, the nation of Elam, and they scatter people in every direction. Mm -hmm. Many times the four winds come to bring judgment, but the angels are holding back those winds of judgment and destruction until the people of God can be sealed. So let's read that, Revelation 7. In verse 1. After these things, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, on the sea, or on any tree. Mm -hmm. Then I saw another angel ascending from the east, having, there's our word, the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea, saying, Do not harm the earth, the sea, or the trees. 
till we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. So we're talking today about the seal. What is the seal? I want to talk about the purpose of the seal and preparation for the seal. Because if we're going to be able to stand, mm -hmm. and the only way we can stand is to be sealed, I want to know how I can be sealed. Because that's important. Yes. We want to look at the purpose and the preparation. But before we do that, I just want to touch on one thing. There's actually two different sealings mentioned in the Word of God. There's a sealing, I call it the seal of salvation. We're going to talk about that in Ephesians chapter 1. After we accept the Lord Jesus Christ and make him Lord of our life, mm -hmm. what happens? We are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Mm -hmm. So we'll look at that. The second seal is a seal of protection. Mm -hmm. This seal takes place here in Revelation 7. We see it again in Revelation 14 at the end of time. And this is a seal of protection. It's also from the Holy Spirit. We cannot have the seal of protection unless we've had the, the seal, seal of salvation. Absolutely. One has to precede the other. There's one more passage we're going to look at before we get into the purpose. Uh, turn with me to Ezekiel chapter 9. This is kind of a parallel passage, and it talks about the sealing. So turn with me to Ezekiel chapter 9. We're going to pick this up in verse 3. Ezekiel 9, verse 3. Now the glory of the God of Israel had gone up from the cherub where it had been to the threshold of the temple. And he called to the man clothed with linen. Now being clothed with linen is the dress of what? Priests? Mm -hmm or of angels clothed with linen who had the writer's inkhorn at his side like he's a scribe and the Lord said to him go through the midst of the city through the midst of Jerusalem and put a what word is that mark. a mark put a mark on the foreheads of the men who sigh and cry over all the abominations that are done within it now the word for mark in Hebrew is actually the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet and it's a symbol of the last or remaining ones, or we could say the remnant. Mm -hmm. We see that in Revelation where the remnant are sealed. Mm -hmm. So those are sealed who are sighing and crying over the abominations that are done within it. To the others, he said in my hearing, go after them through the city and kill. Do not let your eyes spare, nor have any pity. Utterly slay old and young men, maidens and little children and women. But do not come near anyone on whom is the mark and begin at my sanctuary. First Peter 4, 17 says judgment begins where? At the house of God. Begin at my sanctuary. This reminds me almost as if, remember the children of Israel the night before, the Passover, and here's the sign on the, the doorposts, you know, indicating to pass by. So this seal, this mark, saves them from the destruction that is to come. So let's look at the purpose and preparation for the seal. The purpose of the seal, I think it has three purposes. First, it's identification and ownership. It shows who we belong to. Second, it's allegiance. It shows who we serve. And third, it's protection. So let's look at I, the seal is identification and ownership. It identifies the owner or organization. Think about Haman. He took the king's signet ring, and what did it show? That he had authority. It showed that he was acting on behalf of who? The king. Animals are branded, showing that someone else owns them. Think about 3ABN. We have a corporate seal, and on our important official documents, we put the seal because it shows... This comes from 3ABN. This mm -hmm. belongs to 3ABN. Now, there's a seal that the Lord gives us that shows we belong to Christ. Mm -hmm. Ephesians 1, verse 13. This is the first seal, the seal of salvation. Ephesians 1, 13. In whom you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. When we believe and accept Christ by faith, the Holy Spirit marks us as it were, as mm -hmm. belonging to Jesus. Again, in 2 Timothy 2, 1, um, sorry, 2 Timothy 2, 19, 2 Timothy chapter 2, 19, it says, nevertheless, the solid foundation of God stands, having this seal, there's our word again, the Lord knows who are his. So the seal identifies that we belong to Christ. Number two, the seal gives authority among other people. If you use the king's signet ring or you use 3ABN seal, it comes with the full backing 
of the person mm -hmm. who gave the seal. Ephesians 1, 14, we just read verse 13, but the very next verse says, who is the guarantee of our inheritance? Who's that? The Holy Spirit is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. He is the guarantee of our inheritance. The word in Greek guarantee is an earnest, like you would pay earnest money if you were making a down payment on a house or a partial payment. And to me, it's the Holy Spirit saying, I've got you. Right. I've right. got you. Amen. You are mine and I will complete this process in your life. I will bring you to that place where you can stand at the end without any sin in your life because I'm the one who does that work in you. Uh, the seal shows our allegiance, whom we serve. It says in Revelation 7, verse 4, I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000. So the sealed are the 144,000. Mm -hmm. Now in Revelation 14, 1, it says, uh, John looked and saw the Lamb on the Mount Zion with him 144,000 who had the Father's name in their forehead. So if the sealed are the 144,000 and the 144,000 had the Father's name in their forehead, that means the sealed represent the Father. The sealed obey, serve, and follow the Father. They have given him their full allegiance. Mm -hmm. Finally, the final test will be over the keeping of God's commandments. We know especially the fourth commandment. The Sabbath was a sign of God's people in biblical time. At the end of time, it's a sign of loyalty, worship. Whom will we worship? And the Sabbath is a test, is a sign of that. That a great quote in the lesson from Last Day Events, page 220, that the seal of God is not a visible mark. It is a settling into the truth, both intellectually and spiritually, so that we cannot be moved. So who shall be able to stand? We will not be shaken. We will not be moved in the winds of doctrine, in the deception, in those final climatic events, because we are sealed. It gives us protection, protection against the four winds, protection against the great day of his wrath. So the purpose of the seal, it identifies that we belong to Christ. We're sealed the first time, the seal of salvation, when the Holy Spirit gives that to us. Then we're sealed again at the end of time. This is a seal giving us authority. It's a seal that shows our allegiance and that we have committed ourselves fully to the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a seal of, with protection against what's to come. And finally, the preparation for the seal. The end times will be a time of extreme testing, of trial, of temptation and spiritual warfare, of battles from within and without, battles with selfishness, stubbornness, and sin, mm -hmm. winds of doctrine that are going to be blowing, immorality will be rampant, deception will be everywhere. If it is even possible, the very elect will be deceived. God's commandments, especially the fourth one, will be under attack. Mm -hmm. So what does God want us to do? Open up your heart to him right now. Accept him as Lord and Savior of your life. Receive the seal of the Holy Spirit when you accept him. You receive that first sealing, the seal of salvation. And then uh, choose to study his word. Choose to walk in obedience to all of his commandments. And he will seal you that final time just before the close of probation and Jesus comes. Right. Amen. Praise the Lord. I think you set that up very well for uh, this passage that I'm going to take on now, which is actually discussing the mysterious number of this 144,000. Uh, when I traveled on the road for many years uh, with Amazing Facts Ministry doing evangelism, this is probably one of the most asked questions I got, which was in reference to the 144,000. Is it a literal number? Is it a symbolic number? Who are these people who are sealed, this 144,000? So we want, to, we want to cover that. We want to look at that at this moment. And, you know, this particular passage is the perfect example of the symbolism that we're talking about. Because while there's tons of symbolism we know all throughout the book of Revelation, perhaps in no other passage than this one here is it put on display better than mm -hmm. Revelation chapter 7. Uh, for instance, right there at the top, verse 1, after these things I saw four angels standing in the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth. If you get that picture in your mind, mm -hmm. I mean, it's not like we can go to four different corners of the earth and see right. angels sitting there holding back these massive, you know, strong winds. We know that that is symbolic, uh, obviously 
obviously for, um, you know, God is, he's allowing his angels, he's allowing his kingdom to hold back the strife, yes. the major time of trouble that will come up on this planet in the last days mm -hmm. after the sealing of his people. And so what I want to look at, I want to start with verse 4. Um, boy, I have a lot to work with here. Hint, hint. <laughs> but we're going to do our best. <laughs> we're going we're to do our best to get through this. Revelation chapter 7, verses 4 through 8. And I'm going to read through it, and then we're going to go back and backtrack and try to uh, make some sense of this. Verse 4 says, And I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel were sealed. And then verses 5 through 8 here list those particular tribes. And, you know, many people would look, overlook this, this list. They would go right over and think, oh, I don't want to, I don't, I'm not interested in these 12 different tribes. But if you don't read them, you don't study them, you might miss something. Yeah. Let's read through this uh, because there's the reason why God put this in this particular revelation. Of the tribe of Judah, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Reuben, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Gad... 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Asher, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Naphtali, I'm guessing that's how you say it? Naphtali? Naphtali. All right. 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Manasseh, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Simeon, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Levi, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of, I'm guessing that's Issachar. Issachar. Mm -hmm. Issachar. 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Zebulun, 12,000 are sealed. Of the tribe of Joseph, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Benjamin, 12,000 were sealed. Now the question is, is this a literal 144,000 or is it a symbolic number? Okay. Let's look at this first. First, notice a few things. I'm just going to reread the first part of this passage in verse 4. And I heard the number of who were sealed, 144,000. All the tribes of the children of Israel were sealed. So I made a note here. Notice this. 144,000 represent those who are able to stand Good. through the events portrayed in chapter 6, verse 17. And for those of you, she just read it earlier, chapter 6, verse 17, end of the sixth seal, for the great day of his wrath has come, speaking of Christ Jesus, that lamb, and who shall be able to stand. These people are able to stand because they know Christ. They have the seal of the living God. And I know that in the near future, we will have uh, an entire message in which we identify what this seal is and are protected at the time of the universal destruction, as were those who possessed the mark in Ezekiel's vision, which you read in just a few moments ago. So God has a mark, and we're going to read in the future. The devil has a mark. He has a That's mark right. only because God has a mark. Right. He counterfeits always the original. Right. But notice this, and I made this note. Twelve is a significant number. In the Bible, because it was, because of course, there were 12 tribes in Israel and 12 apostles. 12 is kind of a representation of leadership. And so we see that 12 has a special meaning. But what about this 144,000? Is it symbolic or is it spiritual? Is it literal? Well, I believe that there's enough evidence to show that this is a symbolic number. Amen. Uh, first of all, you will notice that it mentions these 12 specific tribes. Do those 12 tribes exist today? No. Where are they if they are? Obviously, those 12 tribes do not exist today in our time. So there's some symbolism being communicated here. Also, if you notice, and I'll probably come back to this in just a few moments, but if you compare uh, the actual list here mentioned in Revelation chapter 7 to the original list provided in the book of Numbers and in the book of Ezekiel, you will see that it's not the exact same list. That's right. There's actually two that are omitted from this list in Revelation that are included in the list in Ezekiel and in Numbers. We'll come back to that in just a few moments. Romans chapter 2, verses 28 through 29. The reason why I'm referencing this is to further prove the fact that Paul has already established to us and for us that uh, we are Jews if we are Christ. Mm -hmm. If we have joined ourselves together with Jesus Christ. We are now the seed. We are part of that seed of Abraham. Notice Romans chapter 2, verses 28 through 29. For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, That's right. nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew who is one inwardly. And circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not from men, but from God. Now that's powerful. Mm -hmm. So, 
this particular list here of these 12 different tribes, most people when they think of the tribes of Israel, they think of the Jewish people or the Hebrew people. But we know that here in the last days, that line of distinction has been destroyed in the sense that once we come to Christ, as the Bible has inspired and told us, we obviously know that we are Christ when we adjoin ourselves to Him. So we know automatically that's more proof that this number here, this 144,000, it is a symbolic number, a representation of God's people right here in the last days. Every single one of us have an opportunity to be a part of that 144,000. Yes, it's a personal choice. It is a personal choice of the gospel. For he has not already read that. Now notice Psalm 91, verse 5 and 10. Let's go there. Psalm 91, verses 5 through 10. There's a beautiful promise for all of us who join ourselves in Christ and make that preparation to be a part of this 144,000. Psalm chapter 91. I'm going to read verses 5 through 10 for the sake of time. Although I would encourage you to read uh, the entire chapter. It's a beautiful chapter. Psalm 91, beginning with verse 5. Notice what it says. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor of the arrow that flies by day, nor of the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor of the destruction that lays waste at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side and ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. Only with your eyes shall you look and see the reward of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord, here it is, who is my refuge, even the Most High, your dwelling place, no evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling. We mentioned that time of trouble that will happen at the end of time after the sealing. We're talking about the sealing of God's people, That's the right. special group of 144,000. These people will be saved. That's right. These people are promised right here in Psalm 91 that they will not be touched because they have made the Lord their Savior. They have made the Lord their God. Mm -hmm. Let's look at Revelation chapter 7, verse 5. And uh, we're going to actually continue on through because I have a little time. But I want to show you something here really quickly about these individual tribe names. Each one of these tribe names means something. Okay? Good. There's a message in each one of these tribe names. Okay? Check this out. Judah. Do you know what Judah means? It means I will praise the Lord. All right? Notice the next one in the list here in Revelation 7. Reuben means he has looked on me. Gad he means given good fortune. Mm. Asher means happy am I. Okay, notice this is just something here. It's beautiful. Nephtali means for my wrestling. Manasseh means God is making me forget. Mm -hmm. Simeon means God hears me. Yes. Levi means and is joined to me. Issachar means he has purchased me. Mm. Zebulun means a dwelling. Joseph means God shall add to me. And Benjamin means the son of his right hand. Now, I just want to quickly, because I have a few seconds here. So you'll notice if you look at the original list in Revelation chapter 7 here, you'll notice that the tribe of Dan is removed. And the reason why that's the case is the tribe of Dan fell into apostasy. Now, if you look at the original list in Genesis chapter 49, while the tribe of Dan is mentioned, you'll notice in this list it's not because it was replaced by Manasseh. Sure. So all of the other original are there. And uh, I think that's, that's, that's a pretty cool thing. I didn't notice that before. But I also want to just really quickly read this last little thing very quickly. If you, add, if you sum up all of what each name means... Asher, Nephali, all of the 12 tribes' names. Notice what message you get when you sum up what all of their names mean. I will praise the Lord. He has looked on me and given good fortune. Happy am I for my wrestling. God is, is making me forget. God hears me and is joined to me. He has purchased me a dwelling. God shall add to me the son of his right hand. That's powerful. There's like a nice little encrypted message right there. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Ryan. What an incredible study of the 144,000. We're going to take a short break. We'll be right back. Ever wish you could watch a 3 ABN Sabbath School panel again? Or share it on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter? Well, you can by visiting 3ABNSabbathSchoolPanel.com. A clean design makes it easy to find the program you're looking for. There are also links to the Adult Bible Study Guide so you can follow along. Sharing is easy. Just click share and choose your favorite social media. Share a link. Save a life for eternity. 
Welcome back as we continue our study of Revelation chapter 7. We're going to pick it up with Tuesday, Shelley's Day, The Great Multitude. Oh, thank you both for your excellent studies. I will begin in Revelation 7 and verse 9. And the Bible says this. After these things, I looked and behold a great multitude, which no one could number of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues. John first heard a number, and that number was 144,000. And this is the church militant on earth because they're suffering persecution and martyrdom. And they were sealed. Why? Because they obeyed the covenant. They're preserved not by being delivered from death, but delivered from the conquest of death, Mm -hmm. if you think about that, because they prevailed over the persecution and death because of the word of their testimony and the blood of the Lamb. Now, he heard that number, 144,000. Then he says, he turns and sees this great multitude. And you'll see throughout Revelation, John hears, he turns and sees. Mm -hmm. He hears, he turns and sees. Mm -hmm. So this is the church triumphant, the redeemed who have arrived in heaven after the second advent of Christ. And they're standing before the throne of the Lamb. They're eternally safe. Every nation, tongue, Mm -hmm. tribe, and people, the worldwide universal church is represented here. So it mentions, this is interesting, that the 144,000 are sealed. But it doesn't mention that the great multitude is sealed. And that's most likely because they are the same group. Mm -hmm. So they've already been sealed here on earth. Now they're receiving their inheritance. Mm -hmm. Let's look at verse 9. And they are standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, with palm branches in their hands. What does the white robe represent the righteousness Righteousness. of Jesus Christ? And you'll remember at his triumphal entry, they had the palm branches that they were waving and laying down. This was a sign of victory. So Mm -hmm. what we're seeing here, both the white robes and the palm branches are signs of victory and joy. In Revelation 7.10, And they were crying out with a loud voice saying, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the lamb. And it's interesting because this crying out is a present tense. So it is an unceasing adoration for salvation by grace. Mm-hmm. Salvation mm-hmm. belongs to the Lamb. Mm-hmm. And then Revelation seven eleven, all the angels stood around the throne and the elders and the four living creatures. And they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God saying, amen, blessing and glory and wisdom, thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God for ever and ever. The angels and the elders and the four living creatures are joining in, rejoicing in the salvation of humanity mm. in this symphony of praise to God. I just wanted to read to you Ephesians 1, 9 and 10. Mm. says that God, having made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself, Mm -hmm. that in the dispensation of the fullness of the times, he might gather together in in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are in earth. And that's what you see happening here. And you know, I love this sevenfold doxology here. It says, blessing. Glory, wisdom, Mm. thanksgiving, honor, power, might be to our God forever and ever. Seven is the number of perfection. So what we're seeing here is it's it's talking about the infinite perfection of Jesus Christ Mm. and his worthiness, but it does not by any means exhaust the list that's possible. And that's similar to Revelation 5.12 that Mm. you had read before, Jill. Um, So he's saying when it says that it is be to our God, this isn't just limiting it to God the Father. This is now 
Christ, the Holy Spirit, and God the Father. It's inclusive in the entire Godhead. Revelation 7, 13. Then one of the elders answered, saying to me, Who are these arrayed in white robes, and where did they come from? And I said to him, Sir, you know. Now, I think the fact that the elder asked John their identity means that he most... He most likely knew what their, who their identity yeah. was. He recognized and understood. Mm-hmm. And he just, he, the, these are the covenant keepers from earth, right? Mm-hmm. So he didn't offer his own opinion. Rather, as one who is still under probation, he just gave a respectful reply, sir, you know. And then mm-hmm. verse 14, he says, so he said to me, These are the ones who came out of the great tribulation and washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb from the dark background of persecution. The church has suffered intense persecution beginning in John's day and throughout the Middle Ages and and even we see, we'll see in the greatest tribulation toward the end of the earth. And in my opinion, as humble as I will I'll say this humbly, I think tribulation here is probably the tribulation of all the church history, mm-hmm. not just talking about the end. Mm. But we see this great multitude, and it's mentioned again, the great multitude in Revelation 19.1. It says, I heard a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven saying, Hallelujah, salvation and glory and honor and power belong to the Lord our God. So, uh, again, in Revelation 19, 6, the voice of the great multitude saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent right. reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice and give glory for the marriage of, of the Lamb has come. His wife has made herself ready. So this crowd in heaven is composed of all those who've remained faithful to God from the beginning of time and throughout all generations. You know, no true believer ever needs to worry about being excluded from this group because we are all included. And when it says that their robes were made white in the blood of the Lamb, this is referring to the redemptive works of Christ. They washed their robes Mm -hmm. is an undeniable reference to the conversion of their saints and the at they, uh, their obedience to the gospel. So even though salvation is by grace through faith, mm-hmm. obedience is how we wash our robes. Mm-hmm. You know, this mm-hmm. is something that we need to think about. He, Christ, mm-hmm. provides the means of redemption, but it requires people to appropriate the blessings of it through obedience. There's many, many New Testament passages that stress the human response to salvation. So here, as praise is being offered to the Lord, it's interesting, there's no mention of what they had done in obedience. It's only the blood of the Lamb because salvation from the penalty of sin, it doesn't matter, you can obey from now till the cows come in. Mm -hmm. And you know what? That's obedience isn't going to save you. That's right. It is only the blood of the That's lamb right. that can remove the stain of mm-hmm. sin. Mm-hmm. White symbolizes his perfection and his righteousness that is imputed to us. So let me read this to you real quickly. This comes from the, uh, uh, what was comments quarterly. in the quarterly. John sees the great multitude, those who came out of the great tribulation, washed their robes, made them white in the blood of the Lamb. And this is the special group of people who no matter what, despite their struggles that they went through, they have stayed faithful to Jesus. That's right. A faithfulness that's symbolized by their being covered in the robes of His perfect righteousness. And this great theme of salvation by grace appears. No matter who these people are, whether they are a literal 144,000 that are saved at the end of time or if it's everybody, their only claim to salvation and eternal life on the new earth is because of the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Thank you, Shelley. That is so beautiful. You know, we, 
We have so much to be grateful for Amen. and to be thankful for the blood of Jesus, which washes away Amen. our sins and, and his righteousness, not our own. Amen. My lesson is uh, Wednesday's lesson, and it's those who follow the Lamb. And uh, let's take a look at Revelation 14. I have the, I need to tell you, I have the privilege of of studying Revelation with uh, on a program called Salvation and Symbols and Signs. A very popular program. Yes, praise the Lord, and I would be remiss if I did not mention that. And uh, if you want a more in-depth study of Revelation, because it's hard to get everything in in 10 minutes, um, you can go and watch on YouTube, youtube.com YouTube .com forward slash D2D Network TV. And we have study guides available as well salvationsymbols.tv. So I needed to mention that real quickly. So let's turn to uh, Revelation 14, and let's talk about those who follow the Lamb. Let's read verses 1 through 5. Then I looked, and behold, a Lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his Father's name written on their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven like the voice of many waters and like the voice of loud thunder. And I heard the sound of harpists playing their harps. They sang, as it were, a new song before the throne, before the four living creatures and the elders. And no one could learn that song except the 144,000 who were redeemed from the earth. These are the ones who are not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever he goes. These were redeemed from among men, being firstfruits to God and to the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no deceit, for they are without fault before the throne of God. Mm -hmm. So let's look at some of the characteristics of those who follow the Lamb and, and what was different about this particular group. First of all, first of all, they sang a new song that no one could sing except the 144,000. This new song, them singing a new song, this represents an experience that they had that was different from anybody else. No one else could sing this song because the 144,000, the redeemed of the Lord, had their own experience, a unique experience. Isaiah 51, 11 says, So the redeemed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing, with everlasting joy on their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness. Sorrow and sighing shall flee away. Amen. So the redeemed of the Lord shall return to Zion with singing. The 144,000 are the redeemed of the Lord. And therefore, again, not a literal number, because it's the redeemed from all ages that are on Mount Zion, standing there with the Lamb. You know, it's interesting to me that we had, in Revelation 13, we had these two beasts, one coming up from the sea, one coming up from the earth. The one coming up from the earth spoke, it looked like a lamb, it had two horns like a lamb, but spoke like a dragon. It seemed lamb-like, it seemed harmless. But in Revelation 14, we actually have the Lamb, the Lamb of God who was being followed. The Lamb, the sheep was actually the shepherd, right? So the Lamb, we're following the Lamb of God who um, had redeemed us with his blood. There's a lot of symbolic language here. Um, so in verse 4, it says, they were not defiled with women. Now, the Bible uses women uh, and alludes to women as, uh, as it pertains to spirituality. So there is the pure church, the woman represents the church, um, the, the pure church as, as represented in Revelation 12, 1, or the harlot as in represented in uh, Revelation 17, 5. 2 Corinthians 11.2 says, For I'm jealous for you with godly jealousy, for I betrothed you to one husband, that I might present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Again, symbolic language depicting Christ's relationship with his people. So here we have, uh, when it says they were not defiled with women, they are virgins, it merely means that they had not apostatized. They 
were belonging to Christ, to the Lamb. <clears throat> now, if this were literal, it would mean that the 144,000 were just 144,000. It would mean that they were men, just men. And it would mean that they had never had any kind of experience with women. They were virgins. So we know that this is, again, symbolic, symbolic. language. And it's, it's um, showing the relationship between Christ and his church. To be a virgin spiritually and symbolically is to be among those who are led by the Spirit, who are not deceived by the false Christ, by Satan and his false prophets. It's a spiritual comparison that indicates the faithfulness of the 144,000. Mm -hmm. So they weren't contaminated by the false doctrines of the harlot of Babylon. Also, it says here in verse 4, they follow the lamb wherever he goes. That means they have unquestioning loyalty. That's right. That means they have followed him. They will go through thick and thin following the lamb because he's their savior, right. because he is their deliverer. Jesus said in John 10, 27, my sheep hear my voice mm -hmm. and I know them and they follow me. So the lamb actually also represents the incarnation of God. In verse 4 also, it says, they are redeemed from among men, being the first fruits to God and of the lamb. Now, what in ancient Israel, the first fruits were the harvest, the best of the best, the harvested fruits that were given to God as an offering. Mm -hmm. The first fruits were your best fruit. Then the second fruits, you know, the first fruits were taken into the temple. Then the second fruits you ate yourself. <laughs> so, so this is... The, the 144,000, it's saying, are the first fruits. They're first fruits to God and to the Lamb. Jeremiah 2, 3 says, Israel was holiness to the Lord, the first fruits of his increase. James 1, 18 says, of his own will, he brought us forth yeah. by the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits mm -hmm. of his creatures. We are the first fruits. And what does it say in Revelation 14, 14? Then I looked and behold a white cloud and on the cloud sat one yeah. like the son of man having on his head a golden crown and in his hand a sharp sickle. What's he going to do with that sickle? He's Great. harvesting the first fruits. Come on now. <laughs> we, are, we are going to be Amen. saved by Jesus Christ. He's coming Amen. with that sickle to harvest the first Amen. fruits. And that's us. We are, we are the redeemed of the Lord because Amen. we have given our hearts to Jesus. And so he is going to take us with him. So I have just a few more minutes. I want to talk about how, well, first of all, they, the last characteristic is they have no guile. And we need to cover that. No deceit or falsehood for they are faultless before the throne of God. Mm -hmm. The 144,000 is not a group that's faultless because of themselves. That's, that's right. right. Mm -hmm. it, we, it, it says that in Jude 24, he is, Christ, is able to keep us from falling and to mm -hmm. present us faultless mm -hmm. before the presence of his that's glory right. with exceeding joy. So we are not, standing there faultless because of something on our own. <laughs> we right. have the blood of Jesus that, and the power of the Holy Spirit to make us victorious Amen. over Amen. sin. We don't want to fall into spiritual fornication. What is that? It's disloyalty and unfaithfulness to God. What are some ways that we can be unfaithful? Disregarding his laws. Mm -hmm. The law of God is a transcript of his character. And so when we disregard his laws, we're disregarding God. See Deuteronomy 28, verse 20. And I'll just have you read that on your own because I don't have that much time. I wish I did. The next one is when we don't give God proper time and focus. Jeremiah 18, 15 mm -hmm. says, because my people have forgotten me, they burned incense to worthless mm -hmm. idols and they've caused themselves to stumble in their ways from ancient paths, to walk in pathways and not on a highway. So when we don't give God his proper time, we're disregarding him. We also can allow relationships and problems to interfere with our relationship with God. 
That's good. God has given us a way. We are to walk in it, and we can be, by his grace, the redeemed of the Lord. Amen. Uh, Amen. Amen. This lesson is getting just deeper and deeper <laughs> and deeper and deeper. And it's beautiful because Revelation, you have to, you have to dive into it mm -hmm. uh, to be able to find out the, the substance to it. Uh, I said that uh, most of Christianity might enjoy water skiing. Well, here we like deep sea diving. <laughs> It's so good. That's the way Revelation <laughs> demands that you put on oxygen. Yes. Because you cannot go under the surface and survive without the Holy Spirit guiding your mind. Thank you all of you for laying the foundation. And, and uh, Sis, Yvonne, uh, you've, you've touched on some of the things that are also in my lesson for salvation to our God and to the Lamb. A um, couple of things I want to point out because there's so many beautiful parallels brought out in this study. I mean, they just, they're just everywhere. You can't get away from them. Um, we talked about Revelation chapter 7, mm -hmm. where the 144,000 are introduced, and then we see the multitude that no one could number. The, 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 the 144,000 representing those who had no guile in their mouth, mm -hmm. and then you had the number which no man can number that came out of the great tribulation. When you look at that, uh, you see some amazing parallels. Then you find the question you have to ask yourself is, what made them come out of the Great Tribulation? Mm. Well, what made them come out at all? A call, Revelation 18, come out of her, my people. Mm -hmm. The question is, who made the call? Mm -hmm. Somebody had to make the call. Oh. Those who were sealed before this, because the tribulation, we talked about the Great Tribulation, the 1260 year tribulation, but there's going to be uh, one later on, a time of trouble such as never was ever since there was a nation. And the Lord is going to, as Isaiah 60 says, uh, arise, shine, for your light has come. Look yes. at that very quickly. This is, this is the preparation for the bringing out of that multitude that no one could number. And then, and there's a, there's a quotation here that Ellen White brings out. It's amazing. What did I say? Isaiah? 60. Isaiah 60. Okay, I'm there. Look at Isaiah 60. Because there's a gathering that has to take place, but the gathering cannot take place in the, in the presence of... Uh, in the absence of a light that calls them out. Isaiah 60, Arise, shine, for your light has come. And the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. What's the message of Revelation 14? Fear God and give glory, give glory to Him. So the glory has to be seen somewhere. Mm. The glory will be seen among those with no guile, those who are not defiled with other teachings. Not, yeah. That means they were never defiled. So they have held onto the pure gospel all that uh, they were not defiled. Mm. But the ones that came out of the great tribulation, they had to come out from this, this form of defilement as the call of Revelation 18 makes it clear. Look at this. It's going to be put together in this verse. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth and deep darkness or gross darkness the people. But the Lord will arise over you and his glory will be seen upon you. The glory again. The Gentiles shall come to your light and kings to the brightness of your rising. Lift up your eyes all around and see. They all gather together. They come to you. Mm -hmm. And it looks at your sons shall come from afar, mm -hmm. and your daughters shall be nursed at your side. And if you look about, and it goes on further to talk about the wealth of the Gentiles, but if you look at what's happening here, there's a gathering coming because the, because the Gentiles see something they hadn't seen before. Mm -hmm. They see the brightness of your rising. The glory of God has risen upon you. Fear God and give glory to him. When this time comes, and the reason why the Lord is holding back, the reason why you go to Revelation uh, 7, he says, don't, don't let anything harm the earth, the sea, or the trees until I've sealed the servants. That's right. After the servants are sealed, which are described as 144,000, then he turns and says, well, well then... If that's 140,000, who are they? Mm -hmm. These are the ones that came out of the Great Tribulation. They can only come out if a call to come out is made. Come out of her, my people. And as we're sitting here and we're talking to you, our church is made up of people that have come out. Mm -hmm. I mean, Ryan, Shelley. <laughs> well, Jill and I and Yvonne were in this movement most of our lives, but we've had to come out of other things. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, but when the Lord gives a message that maintains its purity and you embrace it and hold on to it, he says, okay, I could use you because in your mouth is nothing that's going to destroy the mentality or the connection with my word. There's no guile found there. That means it's truth. 
And not only that, you are not defiled with other women. So your theology is not mixed up mm -hmm. because nobody else from other places has thrown a wrench into what I've given you that's completely pure. That's why they're referred to as Israel, right. to whom Paul made the very statement. He says, it was necessary that the word of God should be given to you first. But seeing that you judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. Gentiles. Mm. The comparison clearly there. Paul and Barnabas are rebuking Israel to whom the message was given first. When they rejected them, they're separate from the Gentiles. They always knew it. Right. They knew they were 12 tribes. They always knew they were not the Gentiles. The Gentiles now become the multitude that no one could number. That Paul says, since you don't want it, we're turning to the Gentiles. Hmm. In the number 12, Old Testament, 12 tribes, then 12 disciples and the apostles, they're separate from that number that they're calling out. But they're calling them out because they have something that that number doesn't have. And Ella White makes this statement. She says, during this time of trouble, she says, she says when the, at the commencement of the time of trouble, she talks about the commencement of it. She says, and I'm paraphrasing, there were those among other ranks that came out, joined our ranks, and endured the persecution with us. So you find this gathering, and you'll be clear when you go to Revelation 14. You see, look at the, look at, look at the, um, look at the cadence in Revelation 14. You see the 144,000 uh, reintroduced in uh, Revelation 14, verse 1, down to verse 5. And they are the first fruits, meaning they're not the only fruits, mm. but they're the first. There's some more fruits. And when the, ga when the, when the harvest comes down to 14, it says, uh, thrust in your sickle and reap. Uh, I behold a white cloud, and he who sat on the cloud having the, uh, head, in his hand the golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And then you go further, uh, verse 15, you see in the, verse 15 says, thrust in your sickle and reap, for the time has come for you to reap for the harvest of the earth. earth. Mm -hmm. This one came from the first fruits, but now he says the harvest of the earth is ready. Mm -hmm. Gather them in. So he who sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. And so what happens is you clearly, that, that reaping now comes out of that great multitude that's being pulled in. But what are they being pulled in? And that's the focus of the lesson. What's pulling them in? And Shelley, I love the way you set this up in one of our prior studies. When Revelation says, do not hurt the earth or the do not hurt the earth or the sea or the trees till the servants of God are sealed. It was preluded by do not hurt the oil and the wine. Mm -hmm. That's now, right. the reason why, because the oil and the wine is needed by the 144,000 mm -hmm. to, to reap the harvest. Mm -hmm. You cannot reap a harvest with a, without the Holy Spirit and you cannot reap the harvest without the message of salvation. Mm -hmm. right. So don't, don't mess with the oil and the wine because they're going to need it. And so in the next chapter... Because chapter 6, don't harm the oil of wine. Do not harm the oil of the wine. Do not harm the earth to see other trees until. So that multitude's going to need that wine, the gospel of salvation, and the oil, the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And when the Spirit of God falls on them, the latter rain, the refreshing from the presence of the Lord, then Revelation 18 comes in. Look at this very quickly. And we're going to go back to this later on and bring it out even more. But this is why the, the gospel message, which is the focal point of this one, he says, Revelation 18, verse 1, And after these I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth was what? Illuminated. Illuminated with his glory. For the, for the harvest of the earth to be reaped, the earth has to be illuminated with the glory of God. Mm -hmm. how, is that, how is the glory of God illuminated in the earth? For the glory of God has risen upon you. That's right. Uh -huh. The glory of God has risen upon his people. That's and right. because his people are all over the world, the glory of God illuminates the earth through his people. Mm -hmm. Thus, we get the quotation, when the character of God is fully reproduced in his yes. people. Mm -hmm. So this character is what's illuminating the earth. What is the character revealing? The saving message, the saving grace Amen. of Christ, the character of Christ. Mm -hmm. It's being revealed so that the earth now seeing that redemption is, uh, is, is extended to the, final, uh, to the final multitude that have not heard it to this particular point. People are embracing it. They're coming out of Babylon. They're coming from all the places where the women prior in Revelation 17, they were defiled by those women, but now they hear the truth and they're coming out. 
And then you get the scene in Revelation 14. They're all standing on the sea of glass. Mm -hmm. And they're all proclaiming. And listen to this. Nearest the throne, this is from Ellen White's writings, nearest the throne are those who were once zealous in the cause of Satan, mm -hmm. but who plucked as brands from the burning have followed their Savior. Next are those who perfected character in the midst of falsehood and infidelity, who honor the law of God. And it says, beyond is the great multitude which no one can number of all nations and kindreds and peoples. Their warfare is ended, all of them together now. Their victory is won. The palm branches is a symbol of the triumph, the white robe, and the emblem of the righteousness of Christ, which is now theirs. Everybody has the righteousness of Christ, which comes through the final proclamation of the gospel. Amen. Thank you so much, Pastor Don and Yvonne and Shelley and Ryan. What an incredible study. What a privilege to be part of the people of God in these last days. Yeah. What a privilege to be part of the 144,000. And that number is not, as we talked, it's symbolic, but it's not elusive. It's not like you have to sit and pine and say, I'll never be part of that number. <laughs> Every one of us right. can have the privilege, if we accept Jesus as Lord and Savior yes. of our lives, if we allow his Holy Spirit into our hearts, he is the one who will change us. We have just a few moments left, and I want to give each one of you an opportunity to share a thought on your lesson or just something about the lesson in general. Yeah, absolutely. You know, as, as I'm hearing all this incredible information that is real, that is legitimate, straight from the book of Revelation, you know, it, it shows me and teaches me that none of us have an excuse to be lost. Oh, mm. Christ has hey, done amen. everything that he it's can good. to communicate his love and his compassion mm -hmm. and all that he has for his children. And, you know, my prayer for myself and for my brothers and all of us is that we will humble ourselves yeah. and pray and seek him now that we might be saved and stand confident in his appearing. You know, I just come back to my, probably my favorite scriptures, 1 Thessalonians 3, 12 and 13, yeah. where Paul says that he prays that we will abound to, in love to one another so that, listen to this, so that God, this is may God cause you to abound, yeah. so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus yeah. Christ. So it is all about if we want to be blameless, if we want to be part of the 144,000, the great multitude, it is all about opening up our hearts That's to the right. Lord and saying, know. oh, Father, pour your love into my heart by the power of the Holy Spirit and love will do no wrong to its neighbor and love will obey Jesus. Amen, amen. We can be part of that 144,000 if we just need to make a choice yeah. to choose Jesus. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. it. When we choose him, his Holy Spirit will take over and give us the power to have victory over sin. And one day we can mm -hmm. all stand together on that sea of glass and say, worthy is the Lamb. Hallelujah. Yes. Simply put, be willing to follow the Lamb wherever He leads and you'll be on that sea of glass. Amen. Amen. I know from the panel here, each one of us have made a choice that we want to follow the Lamb wherever He leads. And I just want to appeal to you, make a choice. Today is the day of salvation. Mm -hmm. Make a choice today to follow the Lamb wherever He goes. That's all the time we have for today. Next week, we jump into a deep subject, the seven trumpets. Join us then. <laughs>